Um, we used to do these workshops as one workshop, but it's a lot of information to cover in one. So I just felt like we should concentrate on one or do, you know, devote two whole workshops to that. Uh, a few kind of housekeeping items. Um, I think you should have all seen in my email, but if you have not, we uh, did get uh, some lavender shipped to us. Um, but not the celery or the fennel. I'll try to order some of those for the fall because they should be fairly um, decent fall crops also. Um, so we'll hopefully get more of those in um, in August. And um, but we do have lavender and I do have a bunch of potatoes that I forgot to bring um, to the distribution day, the extra potatoes. So um, we'll do that Friday. Just check that email uh, for from me for details. Um, on how to get access to that stuff. We would prefer if you tell us ahead of time um, when you are coming to the office and how many of either item uh, you would like. That'll just make it easier um, for us to uh, be prepared and make it a quick, um, fairly contactless uh, meeting. All right. Um, also, Rosie's going to talk about this because she's the one working on it. We've got uh, scanning workshops uh, in conjunction with University of Tennessee Extension that are going to happen May 25th, 26th, and 27th. Um, Rosie, do you have more information to share? Yeah, so um, we don't have a flyer yet, but I did contact um, our UT Extension person today, um, and hopefully she'll get that to me in the next couple days. But um, there's going to be three different options um, for May 25th, May 26th, and May 27th. They're going to be two hour workshops, so it'll be from six to eight each evening. If you can't join all of them, that's totally fine. If you want to join all of them, that's totally fine too. Um, they will be free, and um, I believe the first one will be about with pressure canning, um, and then I'm trying to find, I've got it somewhere, I think I made a note of it, yeah, so um, the first one will be pressure canning, the second one will be um, water bath canning on May 26th, um, with tomatoes. And then on the 27th, she'll be doing um, jams and pickles. So I think they should be fairly interesting um, workshops and I highly recommend. Um, she will, once I get all the info from her, but um, you will need to register for them. That way we have, we know who um, signed up for them and you'll get credit and all that. So um, yeah, it should be, we we normally require that everyone um, attend one food preservation workshop and one cooking workshop. However, um, COVID has kind of made this a little more difficult. Um, so we just want to strongly encourage you to attend one of these workshops. Um, you can, you know, if you're like a prolific canner, um, then that's fine as long as you, that's something you already do um, and don't feel like you need more education on, that's cool. Uh, but if you have never canned before, I, you know, we are gonna strongly encourage you to attend um, at least one of these workshops um, on canning and we will try to organize um, some workshops a little later in the summer on cooking um, to meet Grow Up Alacha's requirements to host these two workshops. So uh, we would like you to attend. Um, and water bath canning is super approachable. Um, I think when most people think of canning, they think of water bath canning. And it it's, it's fairly easy and fun to do at home. Um, and the equipment you need is fairly inexpensive. I will say if you are interested in canning, um, last year uh, in like, August and September when everyone was starting to think about canning, there were no supplies available. They had total, the stores had totally run out of jars and lids. I mean, you basically had to like sell off your firstborn, firstborn child to like get some canning lids um, last year. So, you know, if you're at the grocery store and you want to try canning um, and you see uh, that there is some, some jars and or lids and or lids available to stock up um, so that they you'll have them when you are ready to try canning. Um, pressure canning is is pretty cool. So water bath canning just operates on boiling water. 
to seal your jars. Um, but pressure canning, I think, gets the temperature up to, I don't know, like 230 or 240 or something. They'll tell you in the workshop. But that basically, so with water bath canning, you you can only can acidic foods. Um, and that naturally um, kills un unsafe organisms in your food. But pressure canning, because it's at a much higher temperature, um, will kill things like botulism for you. So you can can um, non-acidic foods, um, you know, like green beans um, or even like meat soup, you know, soups with meat in them and kind of stuff with with um, a pressure canner. So that's kind of just a fun skill to learn. Um, I do a lot of water bath canning at home and um, I've never tried pressure canning, although um, someone has given me a pressure canner. So I am going to give that a swirl this year and I may actually sit down, sit in on this workshop also. Um, I think some people are scared of like the hot water and the glass and all that, but it's actually, um, you know, once you do it a few times, it's, it's pretty approachable and I really enjoy it. And I especially enjoy like eating my um, fresh or my, you know, my home can jam in the uh, all winter. So um, <clears throat> it looks like we have a bunch of I just oh, it, um, responded. Okay. I'm not sure if they'll be recorded, but I would assume they would be, but I'll double check on that. Yeah, they'll be over, they'll be online, if not on Zoom, then some platform that UT Extension um, has. I'm guessing they're on Zoom. Um, uh, yeah, it, it is on Zoom. Okay. Anytime I've talked to a UT person lately, they've been on Zoom. So, yeah. Um, okay. So, those are the canning workshops. We strongly encourage you. Um, pest and disease control um, materials, which, so we're going to be going over that kind of stuff tonight and then we'll go over some disease control material stuff um, at the next workshop but we'll hand out um, everything the pest and disease the um, we're going to give out a bunch of different organic um, pest and disease control sprays um, and a spray bottle and then we will also hand out the sweet potato slips on May 20th because it should be warm enough by then for the sweet potatoes they like it hot um, but May 20th should be good to go and then also we, um, you know, we provide a lot in this program, a lot of education, we provide a lot of materials and really the one thing we ask in return um, is that you track everything you grow. Um, you track your harvest totals. So every time you pick something out in the garden um, to write it down and to do that, we've provided you in your binders. Um, I will just show you also in, the online um, Google Drive. So, okay. So this is the, you know, the 2021 binder on our Google Drive. We've shared this with everyone and we will continue to periodically provide you the link and we will do so after this workshop also. Um, so this is all the contents of your binder. Uh, and, you know, there's there's some good stuff in here. This uh, organic gardening handbook is, is useful. You know, if you have any questions about growing any, you know, any of the things we hand out. Um, but, so we've got a harvest log. And, oh, this is the PDF version, but we should have a, yeah, a spreadsheet where, sorry, I'm winging this. So this is the totals. That's not exactly what I want either. <laughs> where is this thing? Is there not a, I'll have to make sure there's a digital copy in here because I don't actually see this should be an editable file also. So this was what we printed off, but there should, we'll, we'll get a spreadsheet in here. But basically, um, you know, you can keep this digitally. You can keep this on, you know, with, with a pencil in your binder or, or pen and pencil in your binder. But basically um, any crop, and we've listed stuff that we don't hand out necessarily, but you may be growing um, because we're supporting your whole gardening experience here. So even if we don't provide you with a particular plant, um, we would appreciate uh, just that you track everything that you grow and harvest in your garden. So um, on the spreadsheet, this kind of goes on for a while but the you, you know the date that you harvest and the quantity that you pick and you can do this in you can track this in pecs or pounds pounds um you know if you have like a little kitchen scale uh you know you can probably get one for 10 or 15 bucks um and then you can weigh everything you harvest uh, and put that in pounds if you don't want to get a scale 
uh, that's totally cool. You can measure in pecs. And you're probably thinking, what is a pec, Lexi? What the heck is a pec? Um, a pec is a volume measurement and it's two gallons. <laughs> And conveniently enough, um, a peck is also um, the the same volume as a regular um, shopping bag, you know, grocery store shopping bag um, that you might get from like Kroger or Walmart or whatever. And so if you'll just get yourself a bag, um, then you can kind of eyeball it. So you can say uh, quarter, half, three quarters full peck grocery bag. Um, or if you have a two gallon bucket, um, you used to be able to get them from Earth Fair from like the bakery since they closed and reopened. Um, I have not attempted to go find, um, I have not attempted to go find um, two gallon buckets, but if you are near Earth Fair and you wanna go check the bakery and see if they have um, any two gallon frosting buckets, that's also a convenient way to, um, to track your harvest totals. Um, and if this is still confusing to you because it's just strange and weird, um, I have created a YouTube video several years ago that we will also share the links to. So um, obviously, well, not obviously, but probably you don't have much to harvest um, at this very moment, but um, we have reports due to grow up Appalachia every two months. So um, I think we the next one's in June. Uh, so we will, you know, if you have, you know, we, we just, anything that you pull out, um, you know, just track that you do it. Um, and so that we can report back to Grow Appalachia how everything is growing. So I do have an instruction sheet here where it's all written out, everything I just said. And then I also have a YouTube video <clears throat> as well. Um, are these correct? These are correct, yeah. Yeah. We'll make sure. Um, okay, so that is the housekeeping stuff. I, we just wanted to give you a heads up that we are going to start bugging you about harvest totals on a fairly regular basis. So, PowerPoint. All right, back to the PowerPoint. Any questions so far about housekeeping stuff? Great. Um, Nope. Okay. All right. So what we're going to cover in tonight's presentation is organic pest control. And basically, we're going to start with, I like to start with the why and the big picture, you know, understanding why we have pest issues in our gardens, and then talking about how we can prevent um, most major problems through something called integrated pest management. And then I will go over some organic sprays, um, a lot of which we will hand out and some of which we won't, but that you may want to purchase um, at your local garden store just to have on hand. And then I will go through common garden pests. And depending on the time, I may rush through that last part, but we will um, have this uh, presentation uploaded into that um, Google Drive folder also, so you can access all the pictures and information about all the wee beasties that may be eating your crops. So why do bugs eat plants? And I, for this, I'm sorry if you're squeamish, we're gonna be showing a lot of pictures of, of bugs <laughs> in this presentation tonight. So many apologies if that grosses you out, but um, you are gonna be seeing these things firsthand in your garden. Um, so I guess I'm, you're gonna have to get used to it, I'm sorry. But um, so why do bugs eat your plants? And the basic answer is that gardens are really just nice, delicious buffets, you know, with neat rows of single variety of plants just in a straight line. And you don't really see line, you know, lines of plants, you know, of all the same kind out in nature. Um, so, you know, you're, you're kind of putting all their favorite food in one spot. We also have bred most of the defenses out of our plants. Um, and in nature, um, bitterness is also, is usually one of the major um, plant defenses against bugs because um, bitterness, you know, it's not pleasant to eat. And so that means less things are gonna eat the plant. Um, and then we have bred them to be sweet, tender and very fast growing. So they're very appealing, not only to us, but also to the insects out in nature. And then we often plop, you know, these gardens down in the middle of a bare grass lawn, basically, which a lawn is kind of an equivalent to a desert um, in terms of biodiversity. 
<clears throat> so there's no food or habitat to attract, um, you know, the kind of predatory creatures that might normally out in nature eat eat these insects. So we've really created this ideal situation for pests to come and eat our plants. Uh, so with that in mind, that's what we're going to, you know, kind of, I'm going to talk about for the rest of this, how we can, can prevent um, this situation from, from being so concentrated in our gardens. So basically what we're trying to do is bring our gardens more back into balance with nature and creating the conditions that really foster all the good bugs and other um, large and small creatures to, to be in our garden and to eat the pests that are there. And I think some people are um, terrified or disgusted by bugs to the point where they don't want any insects in their garden at all. But um, there's actually the, the vast majority of insects that will visit your garden are going to be harmless or beneficial. Um, there's only a small percentage of them um, and that that are going to cause harm, even though you know they may multiply rapidly and quickly get out of control um, in your garden. Uh, variety wise, there's only a very few that are actually going to cause cause um, trouble. Um, so good bugs, you know, by attracting good insects into your garden, you know, they're going to do the hard work. So good bugs, the predatory bugs will come to your garden. If you attract them into your garden, they will be there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, hunting and eating um, the bad bugs in your garden. So, you know, you may be out there for a couple hours, you know, on a given day, but those, the good bugs will be out there full time um, doing that hard work for you. And, you know, not only do they eat things, but sometimes they lay their egg sacs into uh, other creature, creature, creatures and um, so that those children can burst out and eat the things from the inside out. So this is a tomato horn worm, which is, will defoliate a um, tomato plant pretty quickly, but this is the egg sacs of a parasitic wasp that has laid its eggs into the caterpillar, and those wasps will hatch, and they will bury into the caterpillar, and they will eat them from the inside out. Um, nature is truly magnificent. <laughs> so um, if you ever see a tomato hornworm crawling around and it's got all these little egg sacs on it, don't kill it. Just leave it alone. That thing is dead already. It's it's the walking dead. And um, I don't know, there's probably 30 or 40 little egg sacs here. And so each of those is going to hatch into a new parasitic wasp that's going to go out and um, terrifyingly consume another cat, you know, all those other caterpillars out there. So um, yeah, <laughs> welcome to gardening, I guess. Uh, so, you know, in, I, I'm going to encourage you, and, and we're going to go over mainly pest bugs in this presentation, but I'm going to encourage you to start learning about bugs in general, and especially all the good predatory bugs that you can be attracting to your garden. Um, and so, and I'm also going to say, unless you can identify what bug you're looking at, I'm going to ask you not to spray um, because 90% of the time that's going to be a good or a neutral bug in your garden. So unless you know what you're looking at or unless you clearly see it doing damage to your plants, um, then I don't want you to spray. Um, <clears throat> so your garden really should be full of life. So we've got a little ladybug up here, which I think most people know what a ladybug looks like. But um, ladybugs eat aphids. Um, actually, they're ladybug larvae eat laf aphids. Um, so ladybugs are good, aphids are bad. But generally, um, I am not concerned about aphids too much because if you leave them alone, eventually the ladybugs, pretty quickly the ladybugs will find them and consume all of them. So you don't uh, need to worry about aphids too, too much. So there's a couple of good books out there on bugs, bug books, um, <laughs> good bug, bad bug, and good garden bugs. Um, are two books that I recommend that folks pick up. And if you have never used the website bookfinder.com, um, I'll type that up here real quick. This is where I, my go-to website um, for finding um, used books really cheaply. So a lot of times I can find a book I want for like four or five bucks on bookfinder.com. So totally recommend that website for picking up um, books for your garden. 
So, and again, this website, or sorry, this uh, PowerPoint will be uploaded so you can get um, those if you need to, or this information. So integrative pest management, kind of a fancy term, IPM for short, um, but basically it's a series of um, practices that you implement in your garden or on your farm to control insects. Um, and it's kind of like the, you know, if you all remember the food pyramid, I don't think the USDA does food pyramids anymore. But um, if you remember back in the day, there was a food pyramid and on the bottom were all the foods that you needed to eat the most of every day. And at the top of the pyramid were all the foods that you needed to eat the least of every day. And so this is kind of the same principle, um, except with you know, cultural practice or with practices um, in your garden. So, um, and, and basically the ones on the bottom are the least environmentally harmful and, um, and the most beneficial to your garden and to the environment. So we're gonna talk about each of these, starting with cultural controls, then physical controls, then biological controls. And then finally, the last thing, the one you wanna do the least of in your garden is chemical controls. Um, so we'll go through all of this. And um, so the first two, cultural and physical are very preventative. Biological, you're starting to get into um, you know, reactionary, um, practices and then chemicals is, you know, you only spray chemicals in reaction to an out of control pest population. <clears throat> so um, cultural controls, um, basically first and foremost, you're creating habitat and providing food for beneficial insects. So what does that look like? Basic, and, and that comes down to planting a lot of flowers. The more flowers you can plant in and around your garden, uh, the more, uh, beneficial insects you're going to be able to attract. And, and this is a diversity of flowers in size, um, especially planting a lot of small flowers and planting large flowers. Um, the more different kinds of flowers you have, uh, the more different kinds of insects you're going to bring into your garden, uh, most of which, all of which with, with the flowers are going to be beneficial for you. Using a lot of mulch in your pathways and around your plants. Um, creates habitat for predatory insects, building rock and brush piles, you know, around, you know, around the edges of your yard, or around the edges of your garden, um, creates habitat and, and shelter for not only insects, but also things like snakes and frogs and birds. Um, and hopefully um, the vast majority of snakes also are quite beneficial um, and are things that you want. Um, they're, they're not gonna harm you but they are going to help manage, you know, things like rats and voles and, and other things that you don't want in your garden. Um, so it, it's beneficial to, to provide habitat and places for them to hide out. Frogs are awesome insect eaters too. Um, uh, if you build bat houses um, <clears throat> around your yard, that is also great too. Planting hedgerows, having bushes and hedges around the edge of your yard attracts, provides habitat. Um, and then also providing some water like if you have a bird feeder or um, even a more shallow container, excuse me, um, for, for bees to come get water uh, is also quite beneficial. But at a minimum, you want about 5% of your garden to be in flowers at any given time. Um, and this is especially true if you don't have um, flower beds near your garden. So this could even just mean letting certain herbs um, like uh, basil, um, cilantro, dill, letting, letting things like that, um, letting a certain percentage of those plants go to flower. Like um, you don't want to let all of your basil go to flower uh, because then it, the leaves become very tiny and they become a little more bitter. Um, but leaving one or two plants um, to go to flower uh, and having different herbs like cilantro and dill to go, go to flower and then planting actual flowers like nasturtiums and um, um, well, actually, I think I have a whole list. Yes. So these are these are good flowers. Um, a lot of these are native. And this is a good variety of different types of flowers and different sizes of flowers, because some insects prefer really tiny flowers and some want bigger flowers. Um, so by providing a, a diversity, again, you're going to attract a diversity of insects. So these are all pretty easy to grow. Some of these um, are perennials. So you want to keep you know, like the yarrow and the coneflowers and black-eyed Susan, the mountain mint, um, goldenrod uh, are perennials. So you'll kind of want to put those on the edge 
um, or maybe if you want to create like a permanent strip of flowers um, going down the middle of your garden, <clears throat> uh, that would also be an option. Yeah, so you could totally put annuals in in your garden, uh, like marigolds. That's the one I was thinking of. I don't know that I put that on here, but um, marigolds would be um, and nasturtiums and different herbs would be good to plant, you know, within your garden. So just kind of putting them, you know, um, if you have whiter rows, putting them, just kind of sprinkle them throughout um, would be good. And then I would put the, I wouldn't put the perennials, um, I'd give them a permanent bed because I wouldn't put, sprinkle those randomly around because then you're just going to have a random plant growing for many years in a random spot in your garden. So um, plan for perennials, but definitely you know, put in annuals wherever. <clears throat> and this is just a sample. I mean, any flower is good um, in your garden. So avoid um, synthetic and conventional fertilizers um, because they cause um, unnaturally rapid growth in your plants. You want to provide an adequate amount of water, um, not too little, not too much. Uh, and that's something you're probably just gonna have to learn on your, you know, as you trial and error and as you go through your gardening journey over the years, you will figure out um, what is and is not too much water. So, and then also removing any stress, diseased or damaged plants from your garden. Um, so when a plant gets stressed or damaged um, in some way, it will actually release stress hormones um, out into the air. And a lot of insects um, are attracted to those stress hormones uh, and will come attack a plant because a, a stressed out, a damaged plant is a weak plant and its defenses are down. And so insects are going to naturally be drawn to that smell, um, those hormones. So as far as I'm concerned, if something is going wrong, if a plant doesn't look good, um, I would get it out <laughs> of your garden um, so that it doesn't kind of bring in uh, other bad stuff into the garden. So, and this is especially true as we transition um, from kind of cooler season plants um, to the, to like August, um, July, August is generally when things like cabbage and kale, broccoli, bra any kind of anything in the brassica family tends to get really stressed out by the heat. Um, and that's really when you see a lot of the bad, bad pest problems on these plants. And so I think the best, rather than, you know, you could tackle like the harlequin bugs. We'll talk a little bit more about those. Um, you could tackle the harlequin bugs with a broad spectrum pesticide. Um, they kind of laugh at anything other than the most extreme pesticides. Um, but I think it's better to just get those plants out. When 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 the bugs get out of control on those plants, that's kind of a sign that it's time to get them out of the garden, that it's too hot for them. So, and then I like to, I generally try to get the brassicas out by August and I will remind everyone of this, but I like to give, get brassicas out at the beginning of August or at, yeah. And then spend a good um, three, four weeks with no brassicas at all in my garden. Um, and that way all of the, um, bugs that love to eat brassicas fly off elsewhere. And then, so when I plant them again in late August or early September, they have a fighting chance as we go into fall um, of not getting destroyed by the bugs. <clears throat> so, so just understanding, you know, what kind of conditions stress plants out and, and, you know, pulling them out if you, if you notice those conditions. Other things. <clears throat> So again, like I said earlier, creating habitat for birds, bats, lizards, snakes, and amphibians as best you can in whatever conditions you have in your garden. Uh, excuse me again. Selecting for disease and pest resistant varieties, um, which, you know, lucky for you is what I spend a lot of my winter doing is crawling through um, seed catalogs, trying to find um, the latest, especially for ones um, like tomatoes and cucurbits, um, trying to find the most disease resistant uh, varieties for you so that they have a fighting chance of not dying immediately. Um, then you could, there's all, but alternatively, you can use highly susceptible varieties as what they call a trap crop. So um, for whatever reason, you know, certain varieties um, are very attractive to um, certain pests. And so you can actually take advantage of this um, and put the plant, the plant them deliberately at the edge of your garden or 
maybe in a, in a garden bed kind of further away from your main garden. So all the pests fly over there and then you can spray those plants um, with kind of the stronger pesticides or um, once they get to a certain infestation level to just pull them and burn them or trash them or something. Um, but but you're you're using <clears throat> those trap crops to draw draw pests away from your main crops. Um, companion planting and intercropping with flowers and strong smelling herbs can um, help kind of disrupt that buffet line effect of, of just having one variety of plant down a straight line. And then removing pest habitat and host weeds. Um, as you learn more about these different bugs and their habitats and their habits, um, you can make sure that you're not accidentally creating environments for them to, th to thrive. So for instance, harlequin bugs and um, cabbage worms. Oh boy. Um, will host on wild um, mustard, which is something you can see in bloom right now along the roadsides. Um, it's that yellow kind of flower. And so not having that around your yard can be helpful. Um, but here's some pictures. So companion planting, just basically having a diversity, um, creating brush pile habitats, um, the wild mustard, here's a picture of it. And then the trap cropping. You can see, <coughs> You've got, um, I think, cucumber or some kind of squash here, and then it's, the trap crop is the blue hubbard. For whatever reason, blue hubbard is a variety that's very attractive to cucumber beetles and also to squash vine borers. So it's um, it's a you're you're unlikely to get any blue hubbard squash, um, which is supposedly a very delicious squash. Um, someone's asking, is the Harmony fertilizer good for flowers? Uh, it will have instructions on the bag about for trees and flowers and just about everything. So just follow those um, instructions if you wanna use it. It is a 50 pound bag of fertilizer and you're unlikely to use it all in your garden. So feel free to spread the magic around. Um, all right, <clears throat> let's keep going. <clears throat> okay, so um, uh, other cultural practices. Um, again, there's a lot you can be doing preventatively and you don't have to implement everything all at once. You can kind of gradually ease into these lists of best practices in your garden over a couple of years. So time plantings to avoid pest arrivals. So some plant pests don't overwinter here. Uh, some, a lot of stuff does overwinter and just kind of appears on its own whenever. But um, squash vine borers generally arrive here in July because they're flying up from Florida. And then very soon after the squash vine borers, the pickle worms appear um, generally in late July, early August um, is when these little guys appear. And pickle worm was not uh, historically a pest in um, East Tennessee. It's definitely a big pest in <clears throat> like Florida and Texas and along the Gulf Coast, but it is not been traditionally a pest here. However, thanks to global warming, um, we are getting waves of pickle worm. Um, <coughs> and I didn't even see pickle worms. When we first started this program, I never saw pickle worms, but the last three years they've been really bad. So beware that they are coming. Um, and it's bad to the point where we may not be able to grow squash or cucumbers um, after August here um, because they're just really hard to control and they destroy uh, your plants pretty quickly. So um, the best thing you can do is just plant as early as possible um, and so that you get your crops in uh, and they get mature and you get a harvest before um, things arrive. You can, um, I'll talk a little bit about <coughs> covering stuff. Um, and that's so you can cover the plants with um, fabric, with like a um, insect fabric, basically, and that can help um, prevent some. So again, preventing diseases is another way to um, keep pests off your plants because healthy plants are better able to defend them, defend themselves. And so we'll just discuss um, disease control the next month, hopefully. Um, I won't be coughing so much by then, <laughs> I can only hope. Um, 
so now we're going to get into physical controls. And so cultural controls are, are more kind of general preventative practices um, in gardening. And physical controls are more active practices um, that you're actually doing to control bugs. So number one thing you can do to control insect pests is to hand pick them. Um, this is the safest, um, even if it's not the most fun thing to spend your time doing. Um, but in terms of environmental impacts, this is the safest thing you could be doing. So it's just I pre toddler. Um, I don't know that I would be able to do this now, but um, you know you can get a bucket of soapy water. I just usually go out first thing in the morning and um, hand pick plants because um, as they're coming out of the night, it's early in the morning. Um, the bugs are still kind of moving really slowly uh, in the cool weather and the cool temperatures, and so they're easy to easier to grab and stick in your soapy water. And the soap is important because that reduces the surface tension of the water. Because um, if you just throw a bug on um, a cup of plain water, it's going to float most of the times on the surface, but the the soap allows them to sink and drown. So that is important. Um, you can also use insect barrier. I've got a picture on the next mm -hmm. slide. Yeah. And that's just a really light grade of, of fabric. Um, um, so, Um, <clears throat> that is something you can use. Uh, I find them that they, that the fabric is so lightweight that it often just gets holes punched in it and it becomes useless. So, um, <clears throat> try it out. <laughs> it may not work though. Um, if you have bigger critters like deer, groundhogs, rabbits, that kind of thing, um, some kind of fence may be more appropriate. Um, Deer can hop over pretty tall fencing. Um, so sometimes using multiple uh, smaller fences kind of lined next to each other can help confuse deer and keep them away. Um, thick mulch is also really good. I know I talk about mulching a lot, um, but even like a thick layer of mulch uh, attracts predatory beetles into your garden and they uh, like the mulch and they will crawl around in the mulch and, and eat munch on your pests. Um, I'll, I've got a picture of a plant collar. If you, I generally don't see many issues with cutworms. I think that's a little more, um, it's a bigger pest in different regions of the U.S. and not necessarily here. But if you have a, a, a plant that's, you know, that you put in the ground and it's doing good and it looks really healthy. And then one day you come, you know, and look at it and it's just lying dead on the ground and it looks like it's been severed from its stem. That's a cutworm. And um, basically, you just have to put collars around all your plants. I've got a picture. They, you can buy little plastic collars for them or little paper collars, or you can just use like um, paper towel tubes. You can cut them and make your own collars. <clears throat> um, and then also pheromone traps. Um, but pheromone traps can be useful for monitoring um, pest levels as a part of, of um integrated pest management um, systems, but sometimes they cause more harm than good. So just be careful if you do decide to use a pheromone trap located as far away from your garden as possible because it may have the opposite of effect of what you want, which is that it will just draw all the insects from everyone else's yard into your yard. So just be careful um, with pheromone traps. So yeah, deer fencing, like this person, poor person, I just stole this picture off the internet, but clearly they have a deer problem and they had to build a nine foot fence around their whole garden. Um, here's a picture of soapy water with a bunch of dead bugs, plant color you can see. Um, it's just basically a cardboard tube um, buried around the base of the plant. Insect netting, um, insect netting is very useful, especially for um, things that don't require pollination. So it's great for anything in the brassica family because, um, you know, you're not growing those for uh, their fruit. You're basically growing them for their, their leaves and sometimes for their flowers. Uh, so um, because they don't require pollination, uh, you can leave the netting on them full time and that will really help to protect um, <clears throat> your plants from, from all the cabbage worms. They are less useful um, for things that need pollination like cucumbers and squash. Um, if you do feel like you want to put netting over your cucumbers and squash, you may have to get in there and hand pollinate um, in order to make sure that you have fruit set. And then um, pheromone traps. 
and you can see this is for monitoring this one especially because it has these squares on it so you can kind of get a better count of 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 your bug population um, I, this is probably for an orchard like an apple orchard or something that's generally where where in, in orchards you use a lot of uh, pheromone traps to kind of monitor your pest situation um, for the purposes of spraying all right so that's kind of some physical um and now we're kind of at a biological control so these are getting more um more environmentally impactful but not necessarily um in a negative way but um so <clears throat> again um creating more habitat uh for beneficial insects you will also see websites or sometimes in gardening catalogs um the ability to purchase predatory insects um and this can include ladybugs, lacewings, predatory wasps, that kind of stuff. This is more effective on, if you have like a big greenhouse operation and you're going to release a population of pests into a large controlled space um, or a large enclosed space rather. And it can be helpful on large farms where there's a lot of pests. Um, but a lot of times if you actually purchase like ladybugs or something and you go and you release them, you're just going to watch them fly off into the world. And they're not gonna really going to stay in your garden. <laughs> so I don't think it's necessarily cost effective for at the garden scale to purchase these things, but it, it's an option um, out there. There's also, if you have a really bad problem with Japanese beetles, there is a um, something called milky spore disease because Japanese beetles um, spend their first part of their lives as grubs in your lawn. And so if you just spread the milky spore disease on your lawn, that's going to kill um, all the grubs and the milky spore disease will actually live for like 10 or 20 years in your lawn. So it has a long term effect just on Japanese beetles. Um, sometimes people try to sell you milky spore disease uh, to help with any lawn grub, but it's very specific just for Japanese beetles. It's not going to bother any kind of other grub in your lawn. Um, but if you want something, <clears throat> if you do for whatever reason, and again, I'm just I'm just kind of covering these things on an educational way. You're not necessarily going to be purchasing these things, um, the biological controls, because they tend to be a little more expensive. Um, but beneficial nematodes are kind of a cool thing. Um, there are bad nematodes, but these are not that. Um, so if you do happen to have bad nematodes that are killing your plants, and again, that's more of a problem like further south, um, you can get ben beneficial nematodes to fight the bad nematodes, and they also will also attack um, different kinds of grubs in your in your lawn. So um, I don't know, it's kind of cool. Not necessarily something you're going to be doing, but predatory nematodes, um, creating different kinds of habitat. Um, again, buying ladybugs, milky spore disease. So just pictures of what we're doing. Uh, OK, let's look at questions. Would trellising help prevent squash pests? No, not really. Um, trellising is good for disease prevention. So I guess in that respect, having healthier plants um, will help prevent um, some pests, although squash seem to just attract pests. So <clears throat> I have one cabbage I suspect was got by cutworms. I mean, we do occasionally see cutworms here. It's just not out of control like it is in some places. But if you do find that a lot of your plants are getting hit by the cutworms um, and not necessarily a rampaging toddler, <laughs> Um, then uh, you may need to invest in um, plant collars for future plantings just to make sure that the cutworms don't get in there because they crawl along, I think, on the surface and just kind of snip your plants apart. Um, <clears throat> yes, okay, so if you're, if you're direct sowing into the ground, sorry, mulch is awesome, but if you're direct sowing into the ground, then you, you do want to move your mulch off of that uh, part of the ground until the seed, until the plants are about five or six inches tall. And then you can put in, um, then you can move the mulch back in. Um, yeah. But you, but you don't want to, don't want to, oh, oh. you don't want to smother your plants. Um, or your, your seedlings, but you if you have um, if you're planting transplants, then you can just put the layer of straw in and just kind of create a little hole for the transplant to go down into, um, assuming it's five or six inches tall already. So that's fine. But direct sowing, you want you don't want mulch directly on top of your seeds. <clears throat> All right, now we're going to talk about sprays. Um, 
which is what most people think of when they think about pest control. And, you know, as organic gardeners, we're trying to have minimal impact um, on the environment. And I will also say that the, the sprays that we have in our toolkit are not really as powerful as, you know, a lot of the conventional sprays. A lot of the conventional sprays are just kind of like dropping a little nuclear bomb onto your garden and they will kill anything and everything pretty quickly. Um, we're trying to avoid that again because most of the insects out there are beneficial. And also because, um, you know, you can buy stuff freely at like, you know, the hardware store, the garden supply store. And, you know, there are some warning labels on these things, but they're pretty easy to ignore. You know, they're bright, cheerful packaging. There's pictures of like bugs and flowers and stuff on them. And you don't, it's easy to forget how toxic some of these conventional um, sprays and powders are. Like seven dust is pretty terrible. And seven dust, especially, you know, <clears throat> has a re-entry period of like seven days. So if you put seven dust on your plants or in your garden, that means you're not supposed to get in there for seven whole days because it is so toxic um, that, you know, and, and so that means your, your, your children and your pets need to stay out of the garden too. So um, a lot of these organic sprays, you know, are fairly effective at targeted pests, and they also don't have re-entry periods, so you can spray them up until the day of harvest. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind um, that, you know, whether you want to be totally organic or whether you don't care at all, but just keep in mind, you know, uh, how toxic some of these things that you can just buy at the hardware store, you know, no questions asked are actually. And so read the labels, make sure you're following all the instructions for any kind of spray. Um, and always, even with the organic stuff, just because it says it's organic doesn't mean that it's safe for you to just like get it on your skin. You want to wear protective gear. Uh, you want to wear gloves. You want to wear closed toed shoes, you know, long pants. Anytime you're applying sprays, um, so that you're, you know, not getting it on your skin, um, cause it's it, not necessarily toxic, but it's not great for you to have just on your skin with any of these kind of sprays. So, um, anytime you think you need to spray, I, I think you, I want to know, I want you all to just kind of think about and be mindful of your threshold for damage. I don't want you to see, a, you know, a couple holes on some leaves and then think I've got to go spray. You know, I really, I, you know, with this kind of gardening, you, I want you to be accepting of some holes in your plants. Um, and really to only spray as a last result, result in order to save your crop. Um, and then to spray the most selective pesticide, and I will talk about that, what that means um, that you ha have available, and to avoid broad spectrum pesticides as much as possible. And then also to spray, be mindful of the time of day that you spray, to spray generally late in the evening, you know, as the sun is setting, um, when, all, when most of the beneficial insects have gone back to their um, resting places uh, for the evening. So they're not flying around and accidentally getting hit by any kind of sprays. Um, so these, I'm going to go from like least harmful and most specific to um, the most harmful and least specific uh, sprays. So um, the first one, we'll call it BT, Bacillus thuringiensis. Um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but um, <clears throat> this is extremely effective against caterpillars and it's what I recommend spraying. Um, if you are dealing with a lot of cabbage worms, um, especially, that's probably what I use it the most for, is to protect uh, my brassicas. It is totally non-toxic to any to to anything um, that is not a caterpillar. Uh, <clears throat> so, and often goes under the brand name Dipel is what you see. But if you go into your garden store and you ask for BT, uh, hopefully, if they're knowledgeable it, and not just some temporary staff or whatever, they should know what BT is and, and help you find it. Um, but this is great against caterpillars, any kind of caterpillar pests. Um, it will kill beneficial caterpillars too. Um, so again, you want to spray it um, directly onto the targeted plants and you want to spray it at night um, when, you know, it, uh, and when it's not windy so that it's just going where you need it to go. Uh, milky spore disease, I, I mentioned that for Japanese beetles, beneficial nematodes, again, um, 
generally come as a spray, even though they're a living creature, um, and can be sprayed directly onto the soil. So, um, oh, and I will say, yes, yeah, so the Bt is a type of bacteria um, that kills caterpillars. So that's why it's under um, biological. So the next step up is slightly um, less specific and slightly more harmful is um, insecticidal soaps and horticultural oils. Um, now, insecticidal soap is not household soap. Sometimes I see these like little recipes, like insect um, pest control sprays, DIY at home, and they involve putting dish soap, you know, mixing it with some other stuff and spraying that onto your plants. That's a good way to um, kill your plants. So do not spray household soap on your garden plants. Um, but insecticidal soap, um, it's, it's, a, it's a type of insecticide. Um, so don't think you can DIY it. But um, basically both of the oils and the soap work by clogging up the pore, the breathing pores on the sides of the insect. And this works best for soft-bodied insects like aphids, mites, plant bugs, whiteflies, spider mites, scale, mealybug, leafhoppers, these kind of softer creatures. It's not necessarily good against like, it in fact does nothing against like stink bugs and um, <clears throat> other kind of hard-bodied creatures. So you want to, you know, you need to know what you're dealing with um, if you're going to spray this, but it, it's pretty effective, you know, if you, especially for indoor plants too, if you have, you um, potted plants uh, that are getting hit by aphids or um, like scale or something, then insecticidal soap is a, is a pretty uh, non-toxic spray. Um, people like to use neem. Neem is a really awesome um, thing. It's a, it's a natural plant oil and it is both um, insecticidal and it's also mildly antifungal. So it can be used both um, as a as a fungicide to help prevent disease and also to um, kill certain, again, mostly soft-bodied insects. Um, thyme oil, I've seen this for sale recently um, online um, from some of these bigger farm supply stores, but it's very expensive. So I, you know, like um, neem, you know, it has it's also mildly antifungal. Um, but it's so expensive that I doubt anyone here is going to be utilizing it. But I just mentioned it because it is it is out there. Um, there's also minerals and metals um, that are useful in um, pest control. So iron phosphate is actually what's in slug bait. Um, sluggo, we will be handing out some slug bait um, for folks. Borax um, is another one that's good for ants, mostly indoors. I don't know that Ants are generally a big problem outdoors is in your garden. Diatomaceous earth is another um, one that's good for slugs and other soft-bodied insects. And it's basically just microscopic sharp things. <laughs> um, and so when slugs crawl across it, it like cuts up their little bodies. And so they avoid crawling over it. Um, it's really not good for you to inhale. I see some people really just sprinkling DE all over the place. And you really want to wear a mask when you're applying it um, because it's microscopic sharp things and you don't want that in your lungs. So uh, just keep that in mind um, that despite being non-toxic, it's not great for you to breathe. Um, and then kaolin clay is another cool one. Um, <clears throat> I don't know that you can buy it locally, but it is available online um, under the brand name Surround. And this um, also... I've seen people just like dip their seedlings into it before they plant them out. Um, and then you can also put it into a spray bottle and spray it on your, on your plants, but it on the leaves. And it basically creates like the diatomaceous of the earth. It creates um, a very spiky rough surface on the plants that insects don't want to touch. Um, and it's supposedly very effective for cucumber beetles. Um, unfortunately it washes off every time it rains. So um, you have to be, I've tried it. I tried it one year, but I wasn't great about getting it in it, but it also rained a lot that year. And so I wasn't great about reapplying it every time it rained because it was raining so often. Um, so I'm still on the fence about the cowl and clay, but some people claim it's very effective, especially on cucumbers. I'm not gonna pronounce, try to pronounce that word, but brand name Azagard. Um, it's also under uh, a certain other brands. Um, 
it's a little more expensive, but it's still it's it, but it's kind of approachable price point wise. It's not like some of the other stuff out there. It's derived from neem, um, but it's highly concentrated, um, sort of like how cocaine is derived from like like coca leaves. You know, they're not really the same thing. They're kind of a whole another level. So um, in that sense that it's it's a very powerful insecticide. Um, but it it's nice because once it's, you know, once you, if you spray it, you know, when it's not windy and late at night, it's only going to get it on the plants, the targeted plants. And so it only works by um, the pests ingesting it. So um, it's relatively harmless once it's on the plant. Um, and when, you know, and once it dries, it's not going to affect other beneficial insects out there, even though it is a fairly broad spectrum insecticide. Uh, and it doesn't kill things immediately. It just prevents them from molting. Um, so a lot of insects go through several molting periods. And so um, <clears throat> they don't necessarily like pupate the way like um, some some others do, but they they kind of shed their skins and they get bigger and they kind of change um, into, I think it's called instars, different instars along to their a full mature adult. Um, but the azagard will prevent them from molting. And so basically they die because they can't grow bigger. They can't kind of proceed with their natural um, lifespan. So it, it, it doesn't, again, it can take, you know, almost two weeks to knock out pests, but it's fairly effective. You know, it'll kill an entire generation and they won't, they won't reach maturity and they won't lay more eggs. So it can, it can really knock down a population of insects. Um, so now on the broad spectrum insecticides, we will be handing out spinosad. Um, I prefer spinosad to pyrethrin, um, brand name Pyganic. Um, the pyrethrin uh, stays fairly toxic. Um, and if you get it on, if you get the pyrethrin on flowers, um, it can, it can kill bees kind of long term too. It doesn't immediately go inert. Once the spinosad dries on a plant, um, it will no longer impact bees. While it's wet, um, it will kill bees. So you want to, again, spray it at night um, when it is not windy um, so that it's just getting on your targeted plants. I'm going to repeat myself a lot because it's important that I hammer this home. Um, so if you do have, um, if you keep if you keep bees on your property, you may not want to use spinosad because it is is fairly toxic to bees while it's wet. Um, but I think um, if you practice again at night when it's not windy um, and it has time to dry overnight, then you'll have uh, it shouldn't harm your bees, especially if you're spraying it on things that don't have flowers. Um, <clears throat> pyrethrin is kind of basically the really only the only on the only nuclear option that we have um, in organic gardening, it is toxic to everything. It is toxic to stink bugs, um, which aren't really not impacted by much of anything else that I've mentioned. Um, you, however, will probably kill a lot of beneficial insects if you are spraying pyrethrin. Um, so use only as a last resort. Um, I did at one point purchase some um, for squash bugs. But honestly, it's been years since I've sprayed pyrethrin. I can usually get away with, you know, with the hand picking and with some of these lesser sprays. Um, to, and again, you know, if things are truly out of control, I just pull the plants out of the garden. It's, um, it's not worth it to me to spray pyrethrin. However, it is certified organic and it is available. Um, and especially if you're getting into commercial production, if you're a market gardener or you want to scale up um, to a larger uh, uh, commercial scale, you know, you may need to use pyrethrin just to get a marketable crop. You know, you're kind of balancing the, the economics, you know, your investment in into a, a plot of land, you know, versus losing an entire crop to insects. So I think on a home gardening scale, I'd rather not use pyrethrin, but, you know, that it's, it's available, it's organic, and um, <clears throat> it's there if you feel like you need it. Um, okay. All right, so I'm going to talk about. Oh, any questions so far about sprays? Yeah, Karis, don't spray soap on your plants, please. <laughs> Even if it's Dr. Bronner's and it seems organic, that's going to react with the sunlight and it's going to burn the crap out of your plants. 
<laughs> I know it's all over the internet, but there's all kinds of crap on the internet. Um, uh, ne if you want to spray something natural and organic, get, ne get some neem oil. Um, you're going to love neem. Uh, read the labels, read labels for everything. Um, but generally neem and insecticidal soap, um, you can spray up until the day of harvest, which means that once it dries, it's generally pretty inert. Um, so, you know, you, you don't want them out there while you're spraying, but once it's dry to the touch, it's fine for, for children and pets to get into the garden. It's not gonna, it's not gonna hurt them, but definitely read the labels for everything. Um, and make sure you're following any precautions that are listed on the label. Okay, <clears throat> bugs. <laughs> aphids are a big one. There's so many different kinds of aphids out there. They come in all kinds of weird colors. There's gray and there's bright orange and there's green ones. Um, they're gross. They're um, generally kind of create this like waxy residue which you can kind of feel on the plants. So you, and, they, and the leaves also kind of curl up on your plants. So you can kind of tell when there's aphids. Uh, you can kind of see the signs um, before you actually see the aphids. If they are really getting out of control, insecticidal soaps probably, or neem is probably um, the best things to spray. Generally, I don't, I think as long as you have the flowers and um, you've kind of set up a good environment for beneficials, um, this, thing that kind of looks like a weird little alligator is actually this is what a um a baby ladybug looks like and these little baby ladybugs are actually vicious killers and will eat something like 50 aphids a day so um by creating conditions for you know ladybugs um and ladybugs are actually really attracted to those tiny flowers so they like the dill and the cilantro flowers um <clears throat> so planting those and letting those flower um is going to attract a lot of ladybugs and they're going to eat your aphids. So I generally don't do anything about aphids because the ladybugs come in. Um, you can also just try blasting them with a garden hose, um, you know, on like a jet setting or something. Aphids are very bad at crawling. So, um, you know, even just knocking them off the plant can go a long way in preventing uh, too much damage from aphids. And again, all of these slides are going to be up on the online. So I'm just trying to get through them. Cabbage worms. There's actually several different varieties of cabbage worms. I mostly see these little green ones and these this um, that come from these white moths. If you see these white moths with these little black spots on their wings, ugh, I hate them. Cabbage worms. Um, this is like a I think a diamondback um, cabbage moth or something. I don't know. Um, there's several different varieties uh, out there, so you may notice different colored caterpillars eating your cabbage. Basically, um, BT and spinosad are probably the best. And I like to alternate. I, I, well, you're giving out spinosad, and I would encourage you to buy a, a bottle of BT also. Um, and then alternating between these two sprays so that if you just use one spray over and over and over again, um, you run the risk of, of breeding basically a resistant um, population of insects. So if you alternate between two different things with two different mechanisms of action, so the spinosad is actually a neurotoxin, um, and the BT, um, when the caterpillars ingest the BT, it actually forms like crystal structures in their stomachs and prevents them from feeding. So they die of starvation that way. I know, terrible, but these things are eating your plants. Um, so by alternating these two different mechanisms and these two different sprays, um, you will prevent the caterpillars from developing resistance to any one of these things. Um, they're fairly easy to hand pick um, your chickens or if, ch I wouldn't let chickens go in your garden because they will destroy your crops. But if you have ducks, um, ducks apparently are a lot more gentle um, and will probably also eat caterpillars. So, um, and then insect barriers, Insect barrier cloth is also pretty effective for the caterpillars, assuming you don't get large holes punched in it by the weather or your cats or whatever. Colorado potato beetle is another um, big one. Um, I find that if you have a lot of flowers and stuff, these, these are pretty attractive to predatory insects. So there's a lot of things that love eating Colorado potato beetles. So I generally don't find them to be a big issue in my garden, but I have been um, in other gardens where they are a bad problem. So that you'll see um, <clears throat> the, this is what the, the younger ones look like. This is what the adults look like. I think they're actually kind of pretty if they weren't 
chomping on your potatoes. This is what an, a really bad infestation, you know, they will get out of control and, and, and kill the plant basically. And this is what the eggs look like. So um, I've spent a lot of time on farm when I was working on uh, organic farms, um, squashing these things. So they're easy to hand pick. Um, they will get out of control if you leave them unchecked. Um, mulching your potatoes um, creates a lot of habitat for um, um, the predatory beetles, especially that will eat the, the potato beetles. Hand picking, um, spinosad works great. Um, and then the, the uh, azagard also is pretty effective um, on them as well. Hand picking is hand picking works really well though. If you can just get out there every day and get them, they won't get out of control. Um, cucumber beetles, there's two different varieties. There's the spotted variety and the striped variety. Um, both are terrible. Um, both of them will transmit bacterial wilt, which is what you see in this bottom picture. You can see that kind of brown crunchy leaves. Um, that's a bacteria that's transmitted in the stomachs um, of these beetles. And so when they chomp on your plants, they spread the bacteria wilt. Um, so they kind of pack up two punch there not only eating holes in your plants, but also transmitting disease. So um, they're really hard to control. Um, you can try to use row cover to protect the young plants so that, that once they're bigger, they're, they're less um, at risk from damage. Um, but you, but because um, cucumbers are um, pollinated by insects, you have to uncover the plants or get in there every day, every morning and hand pollinate. Um, And then you can also, you know, if you, and another, so they're, they're hard to, these beetles are hard to control um, with sprays even, but if you just plan for your plants to die um, and, and have, you know, as one are getting, you know, getting mature and ready to produce, you're starting in the next round of plants. And so basically once, um, once the old plants die, you have plant, other plants, the next round coming up ready to produce. Um, so you're just kind of, keeping ahead of the bugs by constantly having younger plants growing. Um, the surround, again, like I mentioned earlier, is supposed to be fairly effective. And then Blue Hubbard is very attractive to cucumber beetles. Um, so you could have the Blue Hubbard at you know a different side of your garden from your cucumbers. And then um, you can spray the Blue Hubbard with pyrethrin um, and that will kill the cucumber beetles. And so hopefully that's one way you can control and I've, I've worked on farms um, utilizing the blue hubbard trap cropping. So it, it, doesn't, it doesn't attract all of them, but it does allow you to knock down the population fairly effectively. Flea beetles um, are, this is a much magnified picture. They're very tiny. And they, when you get a whole bunch of them, and I guess like fleas, they do hop um, very, like if you try to touch one, it just hops, leaps away um, like a flea does. And you can tell you've got flea beetles um, because it looks like a, someone took a very tiny shotgun and shot your leaves. It just looks like the shotgun po um, pellets went through your leaves. Um, they are really attracted to eggplants, which is great because I don't like eggplants. So I usually grow eggplants as a trap crop. Flea beetles eat the eggplants um, and then stay off of my brassicas and potatoes for the most part. Um, so if you do like eggplant, um, that can be somewhat problematic because flea beetles love, love eggplant. Um, but row cover does work for um, eggplant because even though eggplants have flowers, they're not necessarily pollinated by insects. They're kind of self-pollinating. So they can stay under row cover uh, and you'll still get fruit from eggplant. So um, insect barrier uh, is fairly effective for eggplants. Um, surround is supposed to be effective for them. Um, Spinosad, I've had various, Spinosad is not always effective against flea beetles. Um, again, I would use only use the pyrethrin um, in conjunction with a trap crop. Um, and then Japanese beetles, um, some years they're terrible and they just eat everything and some years you hardly see them. Um, so it just really depends. You can hand pick them, but they're sometimes, I, you have to get up pretty early in the morning, otherwise they get to be kind of fast. Um, hand, yeah, milky spore, if, they, if they're really bad, I would recommend just trying the milky spore disease on your lawn. You have to spread it in the fall. Um, 
right before a rain or something to kind of help it wash in. I would not use um, pheromone traps in your yard, but if you could maybe convince your neighbors to use pheromone traps in your yards and get the, all the beetles to fly over to the neighbor's yard, that might be good. Um, <laughs> it's not necessarily nice, but maybe they're not growing a garden over there. Um, anyway, locating a trap far away from your garden might be um, one way to deal with them. Mexican bean beetles. Um, I've squashed a lot of these little critters too. Um, they, you will see them. Uh, they're actually a ladybug relative, but they're not, not a good ladybug. They're a bad ladybug, but they do kind of look like ladybugs, um, but they're kind of bigger and they're just kind of like brassy orange. Um, so you might mistake them for ladybugs, but ladybugs don't cause this kind of damage on your leaves, on your bean plants, especially so that you can see the yellow eggs on the underside of the leaves. You can see these weird, spiky, ugly creatures. Um, <clears throat> And those, they usually are on the underside of leaves. Um, they're really easy to hand pick. Um, that's totally what I recommend. Trying to keep them under control as best you can. If you get out there early and often hand picking, you can generally keep the bean beetles under control. Um, but if you leave them, if you, and the problem with bean, bean beetles usually strike when you go on vacation. Like if you have that like July vacation, you usually come back and your beans are destroyed, you know, one week alone with your, with your beans and they go crazy um again surround is supposed to be good for them spinosa it's fairly effective um and then if it's really bad and you really want to save your beans you know you can spray with pyrethrins but i think if you're out there hand picking on a regular basis you're going to keep them under control pickle worms i hate these creatures it's kind of a nice looking moth though um they fly at night um so you one option because you know your squash and your cucumbers are um, insect pollinated so the insects the pollinators are out during the day <clears throat> and the pickle worms are flying around at night um so you can if you're very diligent and i mean you got to be diligent and get out there every day and not forget at night you can cover them and protect them at night and then uncover them in the morning for the insects to pollinate um, they also tend to they'll lay their eggs at the base of the flowers and then um, the the caterpillar is a caterpillar will hatch and um, bury into the um, the flower. So if you're you can go out there and scout. So if you can pull off these flowers um, that have been infested, uh, you know hope you can you can at least try to control the population of the insects. Definitely. So they once they reach a certain stage inside the flower they crawl out and then they will start punching holes oops into your squash <coughs> and that's when they really start to do um damage to your to your harvestable crops so you just want to anytime you just want to go through and, and remove any flowers with holes remove any squash with holes and do your best to control the population, but it's 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 getting hard to grow um, to grow these things in into the fall. Um, yeah, so just try to scout for damage. You can try the row cover at night. Um, it may or may not work. Slugs, pretty common. Slugs kind of create um, these kind of little bite mark kind of wounds in your plants. Um, generally, if you have holes in your plants. Um, and you don't see an insect anywhere, uh, it's probably slugs because they feed at night and so you generally don't see them during the day. Uh, and they are worse in really wet years and there's less of a problem in really dry years. Um, they, there's all kinds, you go on the internet, there's all kinds of effective homemade traps, if, like beer traps and stuff that slugs apparently like, or even just like putting boards, putting boards out on the garden soil and then coming in the morning and picking all the slugs off the bottom of it. Um, DE and sluggo are, are pretty effective at killing them. Um, I generally just, if the slugs are a problem, I just put some sluggo pellets out um, and that usually controls slugs pretty well. There are a couple different stink bugs that are bothersome. And the way stink bugs do damage is that they have this, um, basically this proboscis that they punch into your plant and then suck out the juices. So they leave this kind of, um, they basically just suck the life out of your plants and um, <clears throat> can 
slowly or quickly um, kill your plants that way. So harlequin bugs are fairly indestructive. Not much will touch them. The azagard and the pyrethrins will kill them. Handpicking early in, in the season um, and scouting for the eggs clusters and pulling those off um, will usually get, if you're good about it, you can get into late July with your brassicas. But honestly, by again, by August, August I try to um, pull all brassicas out of the garden just to give them my garden a couple of brassica free weeks so I can restart. Um, but these guys are terrible. And once they've killed, if you let them get out of control, um, they really prefer brassicas. But once they've killed all your brassicas and there's a huge population of them, they will move on to your other plants. So you really want to get them under control um, and not let them just start destroying your garden. <clears throat> um, the other kind of stink bug that is truly problematic um, is the squash bug. Again, they kind of do this, this damage um, crispy leaf damage, um, and they also transmit disease as well. So they're fairly easy to, to kill. Um, and the eggs are, are these kind of bright bronze colored um, eggs. And you can find them on the bottom of your leaves. So again, just getting out there every morning and, and scouting for the egg clusters, is, you can get the, the squash bugs under control for, for most of the summer. Um, there are also beneficial stink bugs. Um, out there, and some of them use their little proboscises to stab into other stink bugs and suck the juices out of the stink the other stink bugs. So, um, and I honestly have trouble telling the difference between um, the the good stink bugs and some of the some of the bad stink bugs. Now, the squash bugs and the harlequin bugs are pretty easy to identify. Um, but I wouldn't spray any stink bug that you see because some of them are um, beneficial. Um, but the two that are easy to identify, um, hand picking and then row cover works good for brassicas um, and then squash when they're young. And then pyrethrin and, and uh, azagard are probably the only things that are gonna kill them. <clears throat> um, yeah, like I said, give yourself a good brassica free window in your garden um, so you give your fall crops a a, a good start. Squash vine borer is another bad one. Um, and uh, it just, it's a cat, technically a caterpillar. So some people try to um, cover the base of their plants with tin foil, or they try, you can try spraying with spinosad, just the base of the plants. Um, but you have to do it fairly regularly. They generally appear in July. So if you get your squash in early and so you can get kind of a harvestable crop of squash going and then the squash vine borers will probably kill that one but if you have started a second round a succession round of squash you can have while they're still very young plants you can have those under row cover during July and then um, these things really only hit in July and they're gone by August um, so you can kind of plan successions around when they arrive, that's probably the easiest thing to do. Um, you can also, if you notice the damage fairly early, you can try to cut the caterpillars out of the stems, um, like surgery on your squash, and then try to rebury the stems um, with soil. Sometimes this works, sometimes there's squash vine borers in the squash that you don't catch. And so even though you've killed a couple of them and taken them out and reburied the stems, there's more elsewhere causing damage. So um, they're actually butternut squash are resistant to the squash vine borer. I guess they just have thicker stems. So anything um, in the butternut squash family is generally fairly resistant. So if you have a really bad problem with squash vine borers, um, you can just plant a lot of butternut and they will not touch them. So that's one way to, to choose your varieties. Tomato hornworms, I kind of mentioned, they get this parasitic wasp. Um, I generally don't worry about them because again, this wasp is fairly prolific. Um, but if you do get a lot of uh, damage and you're not seeing um, wasp control, then spinosad or um, BT, because it's a caterpillar, are fairly effective. Okay, that is my presentation. Again, you'll have these links um, for you. The, um, these will help you identify um, different pests. These are some good ones.
Um, so if you want to look these up afterwards, you can. All right, we got some questions. Cucumber beetles kicked our butts last year. I know they're terrible. Um, and there's okay, and then oh, okay. All right, any other questions about bugs? Um, I generally get if you're gonna send me a picture, make sure it's not blurry. <laughs> I've got a lot of blurry pictures of tiny insects. I guess they're hard to take pictures of, but um, oh, should we continue to fertilize? So you want to fertilize again, probably about six weeks after um, you plant things. Uh, so you can, you know, put them in the holes of the planting of the plants, and then um, about six six to eight weeks afterwards, um, especially for like longer growing plants like tomatoes and peppers you can you can put it on the surface of the soil and then scratch it in and then we're also going to give you fish emulsion too which is a, another really great fertilizer that you could just mix into like a watering can and then pour that you know water your plants um, with the fish emulsion that's really great um yeah so i have trouble so my winter squash died last year after producing two fruits, a spaghetti and acorn. Um, I have not found, um, there's not been a lot of breeding in spaghetti and acorn squashes around pest and disease um, resistance in these varieties. So like, um, like you can get some pretty good disease resistance in like zucchini these days. And in cucumbers, there's a lot of breeding going along, but like acorn and spaghetti squash, I can't find varieties um, that have, any kind of good disease resistance packages. So they tend to just die very quickly because East Tennessee is very brutal on cucurbits that don't have disease packages. Um, the, it's just very hot and humid and it rains a lot. And that's just a breeding ground for all kinds of fungal and bacterial diseases. So without that kind of innate disease resistance, um, the plants just die, shrivel up and die. Um, so. It, it could have been some kind of disease. It could have been the squash vine borers that got in there and just killed them from the inside out. Um, so spaghetti and acorn especially are very susceptible to diseases. Um, so we provide those seeds, but um, you may not get a good harvest off of them. Whereas like the zucchini and the cucumbers and even the butternut squash that we provide all have, they're hybrids, they have very good um, disease packages bred into them. Um, so they're more likely to survive um, to harvest. So probably wasn't anything you did, Karis. In fact, it, it definitely wasn't anything you did. They just, those things just die very quickly, unfortunately. <laughs> um, any other questions? How long will it see before I see something sprout? Um, so some things like like kale and squash maybe just and corn will sprout in like two or three days um beans are fairly quick to sprout like four or five days um and then things like carrots may take like three weeks they just hang out in the soil um <clears throat> beets can take a little longer to, to germinate so it's really important that you water every day and very thoroughly while you're waiting for things to sprout um, or timing your planting before a big rain um, can help too. Um, so we had a lot of good rain today, at least we did in my neck of the, my part of town. Um, so hopefully you'll start to see some things germinate that you, that you planted. Um, but yeah, so yeah. Um, if you have questions, you can look in the the binder in the um, that planting. Um, sorry, that uh, that kind of bigger gardening manual will have um, individual crop profiles, and so that should give you um, an idea of when they can germinate. Uh, and then also you can look online. So if you think it's been too long and you just Google it, um, you can kind of get a sense of of how long something is supposed to normally take and whether you might need to replant or not, or if you need to wait. 